Thank you very much. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so welcome to this uh, repeat of, well, I say it's repeat, I don't actually plan any of these sessions, so I don't actually know what I'm going to say at this point, but it's going it's a second talk on socioxy. I did one yesterday uh, also for the transition summit. So we're going to look at, uh, yeah, what is sociocracy? What are some of the pitfalls of sociocracy? And how is it that perhaps we can simplify it? So I guess the first place to start really is to look at any tool, is a tool is used to for a particular job. So it's a solution for a particular job. So the first thing I guess to look at is what is that job that sociocracy is designed to work for? And it's all about governance. It's all about how to make good decisions. If we look around the world, if we look at many of the projects that we're probably familiar with, we probably see again and again, there's, it's really not so easy to work with other people. Sometimes it can be really, really easy, but the more people come in, the more complicated the, the relationships, the more difficult it can be to actually be really, uh, I mean, I kind of like put it in, in many of my courses, you know, when I'm running a course or when I'm running a project, I really want people's hearts to be singing. So what does it take to really uh, have people's hearts singing throughout um, yeah, throughout a, a course or throughout a project. And there's many, many, many pitfalls that prevents that from happening. So I guess maybe where we can start, it'd be nice to hear a little bit from you in terms of uh, what are some of the biggest challenges you find working with other people, especially when it comes to organizing and having meetings to make decisions. So from the perspective of or making decisions at meetings, what are the, some of the things that really annoy you about, you know, what, what is it that doesn't work, basically? So maybe given it's a nice small group, maybe nice to hear from everyone, or actually, no, given that it's on video, maybe I'll just let people speak, whoever would like to speak. So who would like to offer something? What are some of the things that really bug you? and make you just not want to even go to that meeting the next time? I think the first uh, problem, uh, uh, how uh, want the team work, uh, each uh, individual. My experience is mostly that uh, they wait for instructions. They <laughs> don't have open talks how they can do by your uh, or self. Yeah, um, there's a certain, you know, there's a certain mentality which is just as valid as anything else. That um, yeah, just just kind of just tell me what to do. I'll go and do it, and I'll do it really well. But just tell me what to do. I don't want to make decisions. I don't want that headache. I don't want you know, you take responsibility. Tell me what to do. I'll go and do it. So in that kind of environment, yeah, sometimes it's really difficult to have a meeting where you really get good ideas flowing because people will always leave it up to others. Okay, what else? What other things bug you about meetings? Sometimes we put forward an idea and uh, someone who's been involved with the group for longer um, sort of shouts it down like, oh, we tried that, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and this is like, maybe that's difficult because you're putting for an, forward a new idea, which has energy and might have traction, but you feel like somehow that past experience or negative past experience undermines it. Mm -hmm. and the idea loses momentum. Yep, indeed. What else? What other things? And I'm sure half of these things you're, you're saying from experience because you've seen this in action, because <laughs> we all have, I'm sure. What other things are really annoying about meetings? Um, uh, for me, um, I find it frustrating when groups talk about 
being inclusive but don't necessarily know how to be inclusive mm -hmm. but also don't recognize that they don't know how to be inclusive so they they haven't put background work in to kind of find out what different needs people might have or what barriers to participation there might be um, and then um being defensive to feedback if issues arise because of it mm -hmm. great yeah i mean wow there's, there's so many things i could probably list off a hundred different situations and, and reasons as to why you know meetings can be really problematic so everything from people just not being heard not being given opportunity to express themselves uh people making uh decisions uh kind of secretly and then just coming to the meeting and just telling you well we've already decided that it's going to be like this um and you know and hierarchy and people making decisions based on well i like this person but i don't like that person therefore whatever this person says i'm going to go with this and all kinds of people politics and all kinds of games that that people play when yeah um the other things specifically about meetings is very often when they run over time where people don't keep to the points where the agenda points aren't all addressed when um uh i mean there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things that can go wrong in in meetings so sarah you've got your hand up would you like to contribute something else Yes, please, Rakesh. Um, so, yeah, sometimes meetings can be unproductive. Um, you can go around in circles and not sort of move forwards. <laughs> but we've said that already. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, <clears throat> and so, OK, so let's let's maybe start having a look at how socioxy deals with a lot of this. And I have to say, um, I I studied socioxy in one particular way, and in fact, maybe we can look at a little bit of the history of socioxy to see why it was like this. And it, but for the types of groups that I was typically working for, it didn't really fit. It, it there was there was a bit of a mismatch in um, how socioxy works and how much time and energy it takes to deliver it compared to how much time and energy people actually had in the kind of more grassroots volunteer sector kind of you know activists uh, kind of projects so um very quickly the history you know the, the term itself sociocracy which i must admit when i first heard it meant nothing to me it was like wow okay um and i've since subsequently looked, been told by others and i'm not a linguist in any way and i don't understand greek so um I, I can't say this out of my innate knowledge, but just from what people have told me, is that sociocracy means uh, the people making decisions for themselves, as opposed to democracy, where you give the power to someone else to make a decision for you. And um, uh, but still, I find a lot of people still have difficulty even just saying the word sociocracy. So the other term that is quite often utilized, which I must admit I actually prefer as a term, is dynamic governance. Because I can understand what governance is. It's about, you know, governing. It's about making decisions. And dynamic meaning it's flexible, it's changeable, it's adaptable, mutable, etc. It's very, uh, it's dynamic, it's alive. It's So I kind of prefer that term though maybe it's not as widely used as, as it could be. Um, so it, the term itself, so Shoxy was first coined back in, I think, the 1850s or something by a guy called August Comte. All of this is on Wikipedia, so if you really want to look up the dates and things and names, it's all on there. Um, and he coined the phrase Shoxy at the same time that he coined the phrase sociology. And what he said at the time is, you know, sociocracy will be uh, a, a system that allows people to make decisions for themselves. 
And what he said is it's an inevitability that eventually humanity will get to, that it will mature to the state where people can start making decisions for themselves as opposed to having to give other people the power to do that for them. But what he said in 1850 or whenever it was, uh, is the world isn't ready for it. I believe it's now ready. I believe now is the time when we really do need sociocracy. And I really believe now is the time when we can really start making something happen. And so it was the 1890s when the first few people started to discuss, well, how might this look? What might it look like, this kind of system of self-governing systems? How, what, how? And it wasn't until the 1920s that the first schools, the first implementations of sociocracy came about, and that was done through the Quaker movement and where they used it in one of their schools in the Netherlands. Uh, it was a guy called Case Booker who, who basically yeah, organized it in his schools. And yeah, so whereby the teachers, the parents, as well as the kids had an equal say in how the school and, and how everything about the school was being run and how it was functioning. So one of the students from there, a guy called Gerard Endenberg, he really loved this way of, of working and decision making that he, when he then went into starting businesses, his father basically gave him a business that was failing and said, OK, if you want to try and make a, a company that is really owned by the people, as opposed to having a clear direct ownership, you know, a, a power of um, you know, kind of autocratic kind of uh, structure, then uh, by all means, good luck. And so what Gerard did is he, he studied various things, but in, he was very, very much into cybernetics. So this science of getting feedback from a system before you make a decision as to what the next step is. And so this, this idea of constantly getting feedback and then making a decision, so you're basically learning. Get feedback. Did that work? Yes, it did. All right, carry on. Did it work? No, it didn't. All right, let's try something different then. Um, so he kind of brought that into sociocracy. He also looked at how nature evolves, how nature you know, nature has a pattern, you know, a tree has a particular pattern of how to grow. It will grow up and tall and then start spreading outwards. And then once it's really spread outwards, then it can put on certain chemicals, which then allows it to fruit and blah, blah. So it will eventually find a very particular shape if it's unhindered. However, if something gets in its way, something blocks it, as the tree tries to grow, it says, well, okay, I need to kind of grow around. So it adapts, it adjusts, it gets feedback saying, well, if I keep growing behind here, I'm not going to get enough sun. So I need to kind of yeah, evolve and you know, adapt to my environment. So having this understanding, he thought, right, OK, within social, how to implement social in a much more creative way is if we take, have a base model. But we recognize that this base way of um, implementing something is not static because the environment keeps changing. So how can I make a governance system where we can make certain rules and agreements, uh, but make it flexible, make it pliable, make it adaptable to its environment? And, um, and the other thing that he learned by observing nature is that a system or an, in, an animal, for example, uh, doesn't change its how it behaves unless it has to. So, uh, so it doesn't have to evolve unless there's a really good reason for that evolution. So, for example, if we look at uh, things like crocodiles, which uh, have been pretty much the same, you know, they're, they've been a top predator for a long time. They've hardly had to change over the millions of years because they can still survive very well as they are. Whereas uh, something like a, a bacteria, we can see constantly keeps changing. As the, as the environment changes, it changes and it adapts. 
So, um, so again, learning from this, how can you make a system that, let's say, we have a nice clear idea of what we want to do, how we're going to do it, but through continuous feedback, we can allow the system to evolve. So this is basically what Sochox is based on. And initially he implemented it into businesses, uh, into the business that his father gave him to, uh, to, yeah, to try and get back on track. And, um, and pretty much, you know, that worked and he, he got his company off and running and then other businesses started to try and implement it. And it was mostly kept, you know, so that was in the 1960s that he did that. And it was pretty much kept within the kind of Dutch speaking world and mostly within either the school or business world. Then maybe, I can't remember exactly when, 10 to 15 years ago or something, uh, an, an American business teacher went to the Netherlands and you know, started, um, done a series of, of talks. And he, through one of his students, discovered about sociocracy. And so he was really fascinated by this because he saw that sociocracy had solved a problem that he was really struggling to work out how to solve. And so he got fascinated and he started learning it and he then brought it um, to the English speaking world. So it's only been in the English speaking world for somewhere between 10 and 15 years. Um, so for many people, it is still quite new. And it had its experience mostly again in businesses and in the Netherlands, in schools. So the model that was used for businesses, as I say, um, for me, when I tried to apply it to a, a kind of involuntary group, a group of people who just meet because they're passionate to do and achieve something, what I found is it was maybe a little bit too complicated and too, yeah, there, there were certain things about it that just didn't work and we can explore those later. But the other thing is that the way, especially the way in which people were teaching sociopathy in the early days is using such complex words, using such, you know, yeah, packaging it in such a way that it, it really sounded so much more complicated than it actually really is. And so for the first few years of me trying, you know, I'm, basically what I was doing is I was, um, I used to do a lot of projects and many of them you know kind of struggled because of kind of power issues and you know people and what have you so i was always looking for tools as to how to solve this because i knew that that was my weak point many people kept telling me about so shock saying oh my god you've got to see this it's amazing it's wonderful it's great it's la, la, la. And, okay great tell me about it tell me about it um and they're like wow blah 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 what Oh yeah, blah, 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 blah. Huh? Like what? I mean, I can see you're excited, but I have no idea what on earth you're talking. I really don't even understand what Sochox is supposed to do, let alone how it works. And these were the people who were supposedly teaching, you know, they were the, the main teachers of Sochox in the UK, and they couldn't explain it to me in plain simple english you know i um i come from a i, I mean I, I'm, I'm dyslexic i don't really study i don't really read and write so i'm going to put you on mute sir louise because we can hear you doing your washing up or whatever um yes yeah, so we uh so you know while the words that they use may be absolutely precise and very very accurate they're not words that I really knew. And so I really struggled to understand a lot of what they were saying. So, in, so once I, well, the, the, the way in which I did finally get it is I actually, I was organizing an eco-village design education course in, the Den, in Denmark. And we invited someone who said he knows about Sochoxy. So we thought, yeah, great, let's have you, yeah, come along, let's do it. And 10 minutes before, his session started, he arrived. And I said, yeah, we're having a break. Let's have a quick chat. Tell me, so what is this social oxy? Everyone keeps trying to tell me about it, but I just don't get it. And in those 10 minutes, 
in plain, simple, clear English, he explained something about sociocracy that just blew my mind. As soon as he said it, it was like, oh my, what? And so when this, then, then that can't, and this, and what? Oh my. And I could see how it could solve more as every problem I'd seen in all of my projects before. It was just so clear. And what he explained to me is that the, very often when people come together, they come together for a reason. So let's go have a game of football or let's uh, watch a movie or let's organize a transition town. Let's do a, um, I don't know, a demonstration. Let's boom, something. There's a reason as to why we come together. Let's start an eco village. Let's do something. But everyone's understanding of what that activity or there's, there's no guarantee that everyone's understanding of that activity is the same. Unless we clarify it. So if, for example, um, you want to do, yeah, if, if, for example, you say, all right, let's come together to, to, to build a structure of some sort. But uh, we're not really clear on what this structure might look like, how it might uh, look and what its function is. You know, when everyone tries to solve how to actually build this thing, because we don't have a clear enough structure, clear enough idea of what we're actually doing, what we're trying to achieve, what our end goal is, we're going to end up building an absolute mishmash of, you know, if, if it's, it's, maybe it'll be a piece of work, uh, an art piece, but it's not going to be a functional building that is maybe what we actually set out to do. So we need some clarity. And um, I mean, for example, yeah, for example, if I was to, if I was to say, hey, guys, let's, let's go out for a meal, you know, let's go out back to that, that restaurant we went to last time. And, um, and I wasn't clear exactly where we're going. But, and so one person remembers, oh yeah, yeah, last time I met you, we went to that restaurant in Birmingham. Someone else remembers, oh yeah, yeah, we went to that place, you know, just in London. And, um, you know, someone else remembers a, a, a place literally just around the corner from me. And so when I start talking about, all right, so how are we gonna get there? Let's walk walk all the way to Birmingham you're crazy no 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 we need to drive drive you're crazy it's just around the corner and no 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 we, we can't drive there because of this because of that I get car sick so we need to take a, a train and da, 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 da. and because the end goal is very very different we haven't agreed exactly where we're going everybody is finding a solution to a problem that they think they're solving the problem to if you see what I mean when, um, whereas we could be, you know, if, if we just want to go to the place that's around the corner from, you know, from where we're all starting, uh, but people are thinking, no, we're going to go, you know, 100 kilometers away, then, you know, clearly the solutions are going to be different. So the first thing we need to do is be really clear on what we want to achieve. Once we have that clarity, then every single decision we make can be made based against logic it's logical is this proposal that someone has just made going to help us to get there or is it going to take us away from there and it's really that simple um so maybe another another way of putting it okay i mean all right well first of all any any questions about what i've said so far is there anything coming up because i can go in a hundred ways from here is that fairly clear? So the key thing is, first of all, to make sure that we're all on the same page, that we're all heading in the right directions. And, and that we basically do by creating what we call a vision, mission and aims. So what it is we want to achieve, how we want to achieve it, and some of the steps, the clearly identifiable steps that we're going to take to actually get there. Is that fairly clear? Any questions about that? Is, is there any process to achieve that vision? Because that sounds in itself like a massive decision. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I've got lots of different ways. I borrow from Dragon Dreaming is one of my favorite. Uh, the, the dreaming circle of Dragon Dreaming for me is really powerful. So, for example, when um, if we're doing a course, so whenever I run a permaculture course face to face, for example, we first of all start. So one of the things that I do there is um, I say, right, me, my role in this is, you know, you have come here because you want to learn permaculture. So we find out why people are coming, first of all. So we have that kind of written down. You know, what is it that you want from this? And I've, I'll ask that in a very particular way, which I'll explain in a moment. We'll gather that information and then we realize, right, people have come here because they want to learn permaculture from me or they want to learn permaculture. And I am offering that. So my role is to facilitate the learning process. That means if you know more than I do about something, my role is to enable you, give you the space to be able to express it so that we can all learn from you. If I know more, then my role is for me to express that to you and so on and so forth. The host's role is to host you, is to take care of you, is to you know, create an environment you know, where you can sleep, where we can eat, where we can cook, et cetera, et cetera. But your role as students is to create an environment and an atmosphere that lends itself to being a really beautiful learning environment. So that means having the physical space, keeping a physical space really beautiful and, and uh, tidy and uh, welcoming and you know, acceptable for whatever it is you want to do, whether it's eating, sleeping, uh, cooking, teaching, etc. You know, your role is to, to cook and feed us, to feed all of us. Your role is to um, ensure that everyone gets a good night's sleep, you know, uh, by setting up the right environment and setting up. So we start by creating a vision. And the way in which I do it using the sociocracy is I say, right, over the next two weeks, or well, what needs to happen over the next two weeks to make this the most beautiful, deep, learnful, if that is even a word, experience of your life. In other words, what's it going to take for us collectively to be able to create an environment that really allows us to learn so much and in a really beautiful way and really deeply connect with each other and really have an amazing, fun-filled, intellectually stimulating uh, experience. So. Once they answer that question, we then take from that and we create the vision. So the time it takes is for everyone to express themselves. So it could be just one minute each. So if you've got 20 minutes, 20 people, it could be 20 minutes just to gather that piece of information. Then someone needs to kind of take uh, things from there. Now, there's two ways that you can go from here. And... Um, very often, the way that uh, most people do is they then go into a big debate and a big discussion about it. And they try to get everybody involved because they want to be inclusive. And, uh, and that's wonderful, except that it can be hugely time consuming. And especially if two people have slightly different variations or different understandings of certain things and certain words, it can lead to just this constant battle between a few people and half of the people will just switch off. Majority actually will just switch off. So instead, what I try to do is I say, right, now would one or two of you like to take all of these words and see if you can come up with some kind of a vision? But, you know, just one. So just one or two people. So a nice little team, go off. You know, maybe I can be in that team if you like. In some cases, maybe I just offer it. And I just say, right, because what we want to do when we're creating a vision is we want to create a vision that is not perfect, but is just good enough for now, safe enough to try. And I'll use that term several times today. Um, what I mean by that is, let's face it, if we, you know, we've got two choices. We can either spend the next six months discussing and getting this absolutely perfect in terms of its wording, and not learn one thing about permaculture because we're just getting the wording right. Or we could just get something going, 
that all of us say, yep, that's enough. We can work with that. We can start with that. And we get going. We start learning permaculture. And if we see later on that it isn't quite perfect and we would like to put some time and energy into adjusting it, we can do that. So I can make a vision literally in 30 seconds. Once I've heard from everyone, once I've heard all their needs, I can make something in 30 seconds. I can then, uh, you know, if I do it on my own, I can just clear, roll out something and uh, invite people to think, is there enough in this vision that you can, that, you know, anything that we do under this banner is good enough for now, that it's not going to prevent you from getting what you want. Not, I'm not asking, is it perfect? I'm not saying, is it going to cover every single possible thing that we might do? But if we deliver against this banner, if we start off the project with this under this banner, is this going to be enough for us to get going? So we can actually start talking about permaculture in the next 20 minutes, as opposed to drag this on for the next five days. And uh, so I'm asking, is it good enough for now? Is it safe enough to try? That's all. Once I get the um, consent to that, then we put the mission together. All right, how's it we're going to go about doing it? This is where now we need to start thinking about cooking and cleaning and, you know, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and again, we could, that could take maybe 10, 15 minutes to put something like that together. Again, let's not make it perfect. Let's just make it good enough for now, safe to try so that we can move on. And so quite literally, the whole process could take half an hour or something. If I don't have that much time, I can maybe prepare something in advance and say, hey, how about we just start with this? But then as we continue, let's keep adjusting it. Let's keep fine tuning it as we go along. Uh, but the key thing is to get everyone's consent. That's the difference. And so what is consent? Um, Consent, as opposed to consensus, consent is uh, when someone says whatever a proposal is, whether it's vision, mission and aim or, or any other policy, is this good enough for now, safe enough to try? Is there any reason as to why, if we were to accept this, that somehow it could either prevent me from achieving what I want to achieve through this project or that it could somehow be detrimental it could be dangerous it could cause some kind of upset or is there any reason as to why if we deliver against this vision mission and aim or whatever the policy is that it could somehow be detrimental to the delivery of our project that's all i want to know i don't want to know is this perfect another way of explaining that is imagine if um i don't know imagine if we got 20 people together all of whom who make compost and we were to ask people, right, you've got 20 minutes to decide on what is the perfect way to make compost. And we want just one solution. How long do you think that'll, that'll take? How long do you think before those people will be fighting each other and saying, no, 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 my way is right. No, 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 my way is right. No, 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 you're crazy. You can't put banana skins in compost. You're mad. Da, 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 da. Because everyone has got a way of doing something, a way that works for them. And so for them, this is the perfect way to do it, because in this environment, in this climate, with that particular type of material that's going in, with the amount of material that I get on a weekly basis, da, 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 the amount of effort that I need to put in, this is the best way to do it for me. And everyone's got a slightly different technique. So for us to try and find a perfect solution is impossible. So what we do instead <clears throat> in socioxy is we look for the highest common denominator. We look for uh, a point at which uh, everyone can agree that uh, this is, yeah, uh, if we go along doing it this way, it's going to be good enough for now, safe enough to try, and we can actually achieve something. So, um, so that, that's the kind of foundation. Is, is, is not to look for perfection, but just to get enough going so that we can kind of move forward. All right, and I've just looked at the time. We've got maybe 15 minutes left, so I'm, I'm gonna start wrapping up here a little bit um, and then open up for a few more questions. Um, so 
the, the, the way to make consent, you've got three possible answers. You, and what you're testing for is, is um, in this proposal that someone has made, is there any reason as to why this doesn't work? Is there any reason as to why this could be dangerous? If in which case, your duty is to object. And actually this objection is really a gift because what it's doing is it's preventing you from making a mistake. It's preventing you and your group from making a mistake. But what you need to be able to discern is when is an objection really an objection? And when is it just someone saying something else? So for example, it's very common for someone to say, no, I don't like it that way. I think it's better if we do it this way. That's not the question. The question is, can you find any reason as to why this way that has been prevented, that has been presented would fail? And, um, and so what you're suggesting is a new proposal. Great idea, but hold that for now. We'll get onto that later on. First of all, let's see if we can get consent for this. Can you see any reason as to why this would not work? I'm not asking you, is it the best solution? Is there any reason as to why this could not work? And so if you don't have an objection, then uh, you consent. Uh, people also like to say, I have no objection, which is exactly the same as consent. The, the third answer people can give is I consent, but with concern. So if, any, if everyone consents, if there's no objections, the proposal goes forward. If people consent with a concern, the proposal still goes forward. Um, but, we then listen to those concerns because perhaps in those concerns could be some some little doubt that may be valid that maybe we can then use to see how we can modify the proposal maybe at the next next stage um, or maybe we put some extra feedback loops in to keep checking to see if that's going to work or not so uh, yeah, so consent, consent with concern, objection. Those are the three basic things. The other most basic things within socioxy is everything works in circles. So everyone has a kind of equal uh, place in that circle. And uh, no one is superior or inferior. No one has the right, uh, no one uh, is not allowed to express themselves in a meeting or to test for consent or whatever whatever it's everyone is in that circle because they are they have some kind of equality within that group um and if they object it really needs to be backed up it needs to be justified you need to explain why you object and only if the objection is um upheld if people say yes you're right thank you very much for letting us know that we never thought of that yet that would be disastrous if we take that on thank you very much now let's look for a you know it, it gets um it doesn't go through then we need to see how we can update it to actually make it work um so everything's in circles and initially everyone um one of the complexities of, of sociocracy that I see a lot of people struggling with is uh, how the circles work. Um, so if you imagine you've got one central circle and then lots of other sub-circles sitting around that, um, to, and, and, and this is probably, this mimics kind of how an organization might work or how a group might work, which is great. But the problem is when not everyone within that organization understands sociocracy and how to use it. And not everyone is familiar with uh, how to facilitate or how to uh, keep records, you know, how to keep it transparent, how to organize meetings and so on and so forth. Um, so you have all these weak points and it just implodes because the communication just isn't working. So what I do instead, and this is, not classic sociocracy in any way. This is my variation. I set up what I call a pioneer circle, which I borrowed from, well, from my permaculture knowledge. Because for me, a pioneer group, like in in you know in the English word, is is a group that uh, is kind of a fearless group who doesn't know where they're going exactly, but knows they want to go something and willing to take those risks and are flexible, adjustable, and yeah, let's let's just try and do it. Let's see if we can make this work. 
So this pioneer group gets set up, all decisions get made within that pioneer circle at the beginning. What we try to do is all the different roles that you need to make a sociocratic circle work. Uh, everyone does as many of those roles while they're in here. So we have several people learn how to be facilitators. We have several people learn how to organize meetings and, and communicate. We have several people who keep uh, the records and make them transparent and make them available and so on and so forth. So by the time you then start splitting off and making the subgroups, you've got many, many, many people trained in it. And one of the criteria for me of going from that pioneer circle phase to the, the next phase of having sub circles is are there enough people to make that circle work? Is there enough of content being driven by that group to justify taking it offline uh, or you know, away from the main group and allowing another group to make that decision? And are there enough people who understand the roles to actually be able to make that group? function so so that's one change and i've got several other changes which i'm not really going to have time to go into today um but it'll be on the video that i shared from yesterday's session so i think i'm going to kind of leave it there so that we can look at some questions and answers and spend just 10 minutes just um yeah yeah just getting feedback from you guys to see what what else you want to know yeah, before the end. So um, that's the basics of it. I say there's quite a few other things that I've changed, but from the kind of foundation basics, are there any questions coming up? I see Dario is laughing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hello. Ciao, Rakesh. Great you? fun in India playing around with uh, sociocracy. <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, I, I got some problem, let's say. There is a group of guys that they occupied, let's say, as a piece of land nearby a uh, train station. But they are, I went the one, uh, one of these days that they are organizing for the social job, social work day, but they are completely disorganized. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were eating, we were talking about this. I was talking about permaculture, dragon dreaming, sociocracy and everything. And I was trying to propose if they want to start to organize in a way that they create a group and in a way that create a vision, a mission and everything mm -hmm. to have a direction if they are agreed to do that things to, together for that, for that goal. Mm -hmm. So now maybe I'm waiting the answer of one of the guy who is organizing them Okay. with all the number, etc., to to start a path, let's say, a, a series of small courses of, I don't know, just one day, mm -hmm. because they, they meet one week, uh, one, uh, one Sunday a month. I propose to do it every every Sunday in the way that we start this course, this per course, let's say. So starting from sociocracy and then mm -hmm. also to how to regenerate the soil. Okay, so what, what's the actual question? The question is how to let them get interested and get in, uh, into sociocracy because a lot, lot of people, when, it, when you talk about something different about of democracy, they, they is like they don't understand. It's like when you say permaculture and they say, ah, okay, agriculture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, yeah, I mean, it's complicated. There's a, like, like a good permaculturalist, I will say it depends. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> so um, th th there's a lot of factors in here. First of all, uh, if you're working with a group that uh, doesn't um, want to work coherently for some reason, and why this may sound really stupid, that why would anyone want to be part of a project that doesn't work coherently? because some people really do love that power. Some people really do want that power and, you know, and to exercise their power, even though they say, yeah, no, no, we're working, we're anarchists, we're gonna da, 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 everyone. There's, there's still inherently in, in people's hearts is this, yeah, when I've got a bit of power, then I can, you know, exercise. Yeah, because you find always someone that uh, is not agree exactly. on what do in which way. So if you, so, so two things that I'm thinking right now. So first of all, 
if uh, if the group doesn't passionately say, "Wow, great, yes, I read, yeah, love it, thank you so much, Dario," uh, I would be very careful. Okay. If they're like, "Well," if their heart's not in it, their heart's not in it. It's you're going to be working so hard to try and make it happen. For example, when I try to implement it in a company, in an organisation where people are being paid to come to work to do a job and uh i see that the majority of people are, um are kind of well everything's okay why why do we need to change i'm not going to be able to implement it in the whole company there uh, especially if there's some people say well no i'm the boss i'm 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 i want to keep my power it's not gonna what i do instead is i then take i find if there's a group like a department that is and everyone turns up and at the end of it, they're all like wow yeah we sh yeah we should do this this is great i love it i love it i love it i'm i'm in this is the group i work with okay so to focus Their heart is totally into it and we start with that group and when the other group starts seeing but hey how come every time you come to the meeting room you're always laughing and joking and you know you're you're kind of how, how's it you're, you're doing so much work while you're just having fun as well what's what's going on there's something weird is going on here uh, you know we don't understand this and so then they'll start talking and then they'll well okay yeah wouldn't it be nice if our group could also do that and da, 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 and then you can start spreading it okay perfect so really you're it's it's an uphill struggle to try and force sociopathy onto people the other thing what I have done in many projects when I start a project is I start by saying, actually, does anyone mind if uh, if this first meeting, if we um, we have a meeting in such a way that, you know, um, that we have a clear agenda, that everyone's voices get heard, every uh, agenda point gets addressed, where we start on time and we end on time. Does anyone mind if we have a meeting like that? People are like, that's not possible. That's just not possible. I said, well, if there was a way, would, would that be interesting? And people are like, oh, yeah, that would be amazing. Great. I said, okay, so is there anyone here who could facilitate that? Anyone here who's got a set of tools that can help us to, to have a meeting in that way? Uh, if no one says yes, then I say, well, well, I have. I can I can I maybe try something? And so then what I'll say is, look, uh, if you want me to facilitate, I want to get your permission first to facilitate. So if for this two hour meeting, whatever, however long it's for, if if I have your permission to facilitate, what I mean by facilitate is, first of all, I want to understand what you want to achieve in this meeting. We'll create a clear agenda. And uh, the only thing that I will ask you to do, my end goal is to help you to get where, to where you want to be by the end of this meeting. The only thing that I can make decisions on is which tool and which style of meeting that I use to help you get there. That's the only decision that I can make is in terms of which facilita facilitation tool will help us to get there. Are you, is that okay? So do you mind, does anyone object if I facilitate? People say, yeah, yeah, great, great, great. I say, okay, so that's half the battle. Half of the skill of me facilitating is in, of the success of this facilitation is in my skill. The other half is in your artful participation. If I, so now you've invited me and asked me and given me permission to facilitate you as a group. If you keep sabotaging me, if you keep, if I say, right, I've got in five minutes, I want to find this particular thing out. Uh, so I'm going to invite everyone just to say in maximum 10 words how they feel about this. Uh, if one person starts going off on a dialogue, on a monologue rather and starts um you know taking 15 minutes i'm not going to be able to achieve what i wanted to achieve so you've sabotaged me and i'm not going to be able to do the job that you have asked me to do i'm not doing it for my own personal benefit i'm doing it because you have asked me to do this and this is my role and now i'd be failing in my duty and i'm not delivering what you have asked me to do because one of you has sabotaged me. So can so then I describe what I mean by um, artful participation. Then I say, 
So does anyone object if, if I invite you to do something in a particular way that you artfully participate? If you do not like it, if you disagree with it, can yes. I ask you to hold that thought until the end of the meeting? Then we can have a discussion at the end of the meeting to see how we uh, change it for next time. I can see how I can address your, your concern so that we can, if I'm clearly doing something wrong, if I'm clearly if I'm if for some reason I'm 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 trying to make a decision and I'm trying to force you to make a decision that benefits only me, then clearly that is totally 100 percent absolutely wrong. And I should not be doing that and so on and so forth. So I, I kind of set this up and then right, let's go. And I start delivering the, the meeting and I implement sociocracy without ever mentioning the word sociocracy. And then later on at the end, when they say, wow, wasn't that amazing? You know, we, we really we got through it and we all ended up, wow, unbelievable. And then I said, well, if anyone's interested to learn, this is actually what I learned from sociocracy. This is how I, how I work. Uh, if we really want to work together well as a team, as a group, I would really love to show you these tools so that you can facilitate this and you're not relying on me to have to do it. And then we can start bringing it in. So that's how I, I kind of juggle things. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah the end basically is sorry. Basically, it's just to start from the people who are more joyful about the exactly. change. Who are? It's in there. There's there the mind. answer. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Because I felt also when we are, I was talking about it, I was feeling the energies how they are. So the there were just two or three people that were a bit, a bit more joyful. So yeah. that's it. Perfect. Exactly. Catch that energy. <clears throat> Catch that energy. Um, yeah, work with them first and then see how the rest falls in place. So Sarah, Thank you have your hand up. My pleasure, Dario. Um, Sarah, Sarah Louise, sorry. So I say Sarah okay. because it's got Sarah space Louise. If it had a hyphen yeah. in it, I might automatically have said Sarah Louise. Yeah, you, you just have to blame my parents for that one. <laughs> I, 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 Sarah Louise Philomena and my surname on my birth certificate. And Sarah Louise is the double barrel first name, but there's no hyphen. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Even though I'm not very good at grammar, at least I knew without the hyphen, it's two separate words. But anyway, <laughs> go on. You have a uh, question. Um. So, um. By the way, is, is everyone okay? We go over 10, 15 minutes. Is that cool? Just to, to answer this last question. Yeah, okay. Sorry, my screen went blank there. Yep, thank you very much. Okay, go for it, Sarah. Um, so uh, one of the things was, um, is there any way that you could explain briefly how what you've described differs from, um, say, what XR have in general? Or what what the difference is between what they're doing in general and and i think you mentioned like brussels xr and other places are doing um so that was kind of part one but part two which may or may not be covered <laughs> when you answer that is also you you didn't explain much about if people object so if mm -hmm. there's an objection um how how is that kind of processed how is that managed um like like at, at all <laughs> it, it, yeah sure. sorry. yeah important important part all right so i can start with that because that's the easiest one so if someone has a real objection uh that's it the proposal doesn't go forward um so what we have to look at is we have to, so for example if if so, if we just use a really mundane kind of more operational decision if we decide we want to get on a train to go to birmingham from london and uh, one person knows but actually the trains are on strike or there's the wrong kind of snow or a leaf fell on the track or whatever excuse uh, british rail or whoever owns it nowadays make for the trains not running but there's no trains running between london and birmingham then clearly we're not going to be able to go there. So while theoretically, yes, that's a great idea. We go by train, uh, environmentally friendly and relax and all the rest of it, uh, but it's not going to get us there. So if one person knows that, it's a real gift to us that uh, this person has said, no, but that's not going to work because there's no trains. 
So we celebrate. We say thank you so much for letting us know. Because uh, that saved us waiting at Euston train station when trains are just not going to run. Um, so now we need to find an alternative. So now we start looking at how we can recreate the proposal in a way that really will work. Um, if we go back to a previous scenario that I kind of said where, um, you know, someone makes a, an, says they object to something, but it's not really an objection. It's actually just a, an opinion of, uh, of that they would prefer a different scenario, that they would mm -hmm. prefer to do it differently. What we do is we consent to the first one, whatever the proposal is, we consent to that first. And then we can say, all right, so if someone's got a, a different variation, let's, once we've consented to that, and let's imagine that one goes through that that is consented to, no one sees a reason as to why that would fail. We can then look at the next scenario and see, um, all right, would we like this new proposal to supersede the old one? Now let's imagine if someone finds a real clear objection about this new proposal and that just doesn't work. If we hadn't have consented to the first one, then we've got nothing. If we just said, all right, let's, 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 uh, let's modify it already before we even test for consent, we've got no proposal whatsoever. So now we have to start again. Whereas if this new proposal, uh, um, as I say, is objected to, but the old one still stands, we just default back to the old version. So at least we have a proposal that is live and we've got something sure. that we can work on. So it's handled by celebrating it, first of all, by first of all, looking at it, analyzing it, understanding, is this real? Is this really an objection? Is it just an opinion? Is it just a, a gut feeling? Is it, uh, you know, is there something really substantial behind this objection? Or is it, you know, or is it just someone trying to make up a new, different variation? Um, so, yeah, so once we understand that, we can then work with it and either modify it or accept it and say, right, we need a new solution. So, but the key thing is it's celebrated and you, you say thank you to the person who objects. Um, cool. If we remember what we're trying to do is we're all trying to work together, to move together. That's why we've come together. That's why we've made a vision. We've made a vision for us to all collectively do something and really have fun together and achieve something together. And, um, and yeah, I mean, the, the other side of it is also that quite often within a project, you might have lots of people with different interpretations or different ideas of what they want to do. Uh, but when you're together in this project, you need to make it clear what you're going to do in this project. And those other outside interests should remain outside interests. If you try to bring your, so for example, I was working with one particular vegan uh, network who they said every time they had a meeting, it just ended in bloodshed. So much shouting and so much aggression and it was just disaster. Oh. And um, and so I said, all right, I can help to try and facilitate something. So we had a three hour event planned. First of all, half the people only, you know, not even a fifth of them came in the first hour. They couldn't even bother to turn up on time. Um, so yes, yeah, so now we had two hours just to try and do something. And then by that time we decided, all right, let's just eat something. Let's take the break and eat. So now we had one and a half hours to try and do a three hour uh, facilitation. And so the first thing I started with is, okay, why are you vegan? Why are you here? Why, why are you part of this network? And everyone had a totally different reason. You know? So one person, maybe it's, uh, it's because I really love animals and I really believe that uh, you know, we should take more care of animals and not be so harmful, you know, hurt them so much. Blah, blah, blah. Another person, uh, it's because of the environmental impact of, um, of you know, of, of, of meat production and blah, 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 and, you know, the whole biodiversity and da, da, da. Another person may be, um, uh, it's, it's before my health, you know, because I realised that cutting out dairy products and meat products is really healthy for me, so I want to have a healthy diet. 
another person may be yeah, it's because you, all of you you're, you're you know you're so wicked and so evil human beings are so mad and they're so and they and you know we should only animals really deserve to live on this planet and all you human beings should be uh, and we should have our uh, fight and we i will need to give them their voice and and another person is like well i'm not actually even vegan but i just thought it'd be kind of you know nice to be in a group of nice peaceful people um and then um and then as the kind of you know uh you know as, as people start expressing themselves you see you realize that everyone has a very 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 different story and so when it comes to having a meeting there was no clarity as to what this meeting was about why were we all here together and so when this kind of angry activist vegan was talking about, yeah, we need to go to the zoo, they're doing this to those animals and, and we need to go and protest and, you know, make sure you bring some, some handcuffs and things and maybe we're going to glue ourselves to this and be prepared, you know, the police are going to beat us and, da -da -da -da, and be ready for this and da -da -da, but we need to go, we need to go right now. And the one who's, oh, but, but, but I'm not even vegan, I don't want to be beaten up by the police. Uh, you know, um, it's clear, you know, you want some people are there, everyone's there for a very different reason. So it's no wonder that the meetings end in absolute disaster. So what we ended up doing is just saying, all right, so let's have imagine when we're meeting in this particular circle, we're meeting for a particular reason. Let's define what that reason is. What's the one common thing that we have or that holds us together? This is our love and compassion towards animals and uh, all right so let's create that as the central theme and so when the when someone wants to do the activism work which 100 percent i'm there uh, meaning you know yeah but for those of us who are happy to do that let's have that meeting as a separate meeting outside of this core those who want to learn more about the, the vegan diet and about the the you know health and nutrition let's have that as a separate those who want to do it for you know whatever other reasons want to learn about the environmental and talk about the environmental impact let's have that as but when we're here together in this one group let's talk from this perspective and so we kind of set up these little circles and then it was much more clear so the, what i'm trying to say is when you come together you really need to have that clear purpose that clear sure. agenda and then we can work all together towards that circle those who are working on this circle they can work towards that kind of activism and you know uh, and what have you those and so it's about getting that clarity that's the key thing um getting on to the, the thing about xr um so another major part of 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 how i implement socioxy is to have real clarity around a culture of how we behave how we communicate and obviously xr has its 10 i can't remember what it's called now but the, the 10 principles 10 principles thank you very much um and when i work with sociocracy uh, whenever when we have, when we start a meeting we start by saying and repeating our vision so if it's children in permaculture we start by saying you know we live in a world where children have access to education that is fun that is in sync with nature that uh, epitomizes earth care, people care, fair share. Are we in the right meeting? Are you still happy? Is this what you want to do? Is this what the, the world that we want to? Yeah, all right, great. Now let's have this meeting then. This is why we're here. Um, so in the same way, you can kind of express your culture and uh, say, and this is how, in this particular meeting, this is how we behave. And so, as we're going through the meeting we can make sure that we actually deliver our meeting with the highest you know really clearly to try and deliver and i know and i see in a lot of xr meetings you know those principles are repeated and you know there is a nice uh, initiation of uh, expressing intent and everything else but by the end of it it doesn't always you know uh, not everyone really they, they pay lip service to it they don't feel it they yeah. say those words but it, it's not in their hearts they're saying yeah. it because they've been told to say it and they've been told to agree with it now let's carry on uh, and um so that's the imbalance is is to find those people with the level of maturity to be able to make those decisions in 
the most beautiful way that really serves the most people and that serves well not just people but serves the planet serves animals and insects and you know the whole uh, the whole ecosystem and yeah so it's about finding people with that maturity so shoxi and even this bastardized version of so shoxi as you called it as, as other people say um uh can is only as good as the people who uh put it into action so you know so just because someone you know uh, can't drive a car and you know you don't blame the car yeah it's 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 the driver the, 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 this person doesn't know how to how to drive and they're they're you know then they're they're crashing they're smashing into everything they're putting it into reverse when they want to go forward and they're you know uh you don't say that there's something wrong with a car so but in the hands of a good driver a car can be safe it can be uh efficient or whatever you know it's the same thing with social or all of these um governance practices it's only as good as the people who put it into action and it's about their intent it's about you know the love and compassion that they put into and the insincerity with which they do it and I, I think it goes back to something you said at the beginning about where, um, when you, you having the pioneer group or, or the smaller group and everyone um, learns all the skills they need to to have that group and you have several people learn to be facilitators and everything like that. And then when there's enough of those resources to kind of expand and spread and still have enough resources for the extra groups, it's almost like that because um, I feel like one of the issues which has at least been um a, a killer for, for my local group ha, has been where you say it, uh, like um yeah very much people not sticking to the principles mm -hmm. um and then they're not they're they're not being any accountability process which is where i'd picked up on it was like well if people aren't sticking to the principles there's no process to do anything about that you can't kind of say oh well this person's not doing that so can you know can they do a conflict resolution thing and then they do it because it's it, and like everything is voluntary so even when it's a um uh, someone with a role there's this they can still keep that role and not do the conflict resolution and it's transpired a lot um so so last year there was a big call for there to be a fourth demand in XR because social justice is pretty much there in between the lines in the principles about checking um being reflective being uh, having uncomfortable conversations and kind of learning about our toxic culture and unlearning it and obviously that talks about hierarchies and how uh, uh, when you read kind of the blurb underneath all of the principles it does talk about hierarchies it is talking about kind of um anti-racism and such and kind of so in a situation you might have um a white male and a, and a black female and they might have conflicting views that the majority of people might just automatically go with what the white male is saying because on the subconscious level they're just biased to believe him over her um and and if there was the facilitation going on where people were having the training to then spread out to the other groups to train them on actually how to be adhering to the principles or how mm -hmm. to do the um uh the self reflection or, or or embody the principles then it wouldn't be so much of an issue yep oh, uh, that, that's what I'm trying to yeah so it's how to how to adjust the culture so yeah. I'm aware that we're, we're kind of 20 minutes over already, and I would love to carry oh, on this conversation, <laughs> but I also have other courses that I need to be delivering as well. Um, so I'm happy to have more conversations. What I'll do is I've got everyone's email addresses, is I'll send you an email with um, some contact details of how we can stay in touch. And, um, and I've just sent a link for the next course that I'm doing on socioxy. All of my courses are uh, by what I call uh, conscious contribution, meaning people pay whatever they afford, can afford and what they think is fair. So, and that doesn't always even have to be money. It could be other. Experience. Sorry to interrupt you, Rakesh. I have to go. Mm -hmm. I have another meeting. See okay. you. Okay. Take care, Thank brother. You. We'll see you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.
Okay, make sure you get those chilies ready for me for whenever I come. <laughs> <laughs> okay, also for liquidies. <laughs> All right, take care, lots of love. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, so my course is all by conscious contribution. So people pay whatever they can afford. And I've got a course coming up somewhere in the middle of um, April somewhere. And the way it works is the first three sessions are me teaching how to use sociocracy and my variation of sociocracy. And I'll also show you the classic ways of how other people work. And then the fourth day is where if you have a real project that you really want to get off the ground, that's an opportunity where I can spend time with each group that is, has come to help you set up your structure and to start thinking about your implementation strategy. At the end of the course, uh, everyone uh, is invited to join my, my network, Roots and Permaculture. This is exclusively a student's network and uh, in which we have a regular once a month uh, socioxy study circle. So once you've finished the course, that's not the end of the learning. You can then continuously come to the study circle for free. Um, it's online and continue to learn. And this is where you get help to really start implementing systems, I would say. Um, that's kind of the best way that I've found to really support and get groups really properly up and running is so that groups can kind of talk to each other and we can explore different challenges that they're having. So I'll Absolutely. send you I'll send you links uh, after the yeah um, probably this afternoon. Um, but before we go, are there any last kind of questions and logistics anything I can answer really quickly before we say goodbye? No, I'm good. Okay. So yes, yeah, so so shocksy may be complicated in certain ways, but we can make it simple. And uh, I think the last session that I did, so you'll find a video of that. I went into more detail about how to simplify it, much more than I did this time. I don't know why it took me so long to to get there this time, but anyway, that's the way it is. I say I don't ever plan these sessions. Whatever comes out is what comes out. So thank you all very much. And um, who knows? Look forward to seeing you somewhere, somewhere else. Have fun. Any questions, feel free to, to email me. Thanks. Thanks love. So much. Take care. Hugs. Bye. Bye.